Hi, everybody. Welcome to Synthetic Intelligence Forum Online. My name is Vic, and it's my pleasure to have you join us for a panel discussion on keys to successful AI governance. Uh, before we go into this panel discussion, I want to make a couple of quick announcements for events we have coming up over the next two weeks. So switching from the AI governance theme, we've had uh, three sessions now, including this one specifically on this topic of AI governance uh, in the previous uh, weeks. So we're going to be taking a bit of a switch and focusing a bit more on the industry side. And we're going to be looking into advanced analytics and banking. Uh, and we wanted to look at advanced analytics and banking because there's a lot of interest in financial services uh, industry and how artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning uh, technologies are, are being used to create and drive organizational value, uh, but also because uh, this gives us sort of the advanced analytics piece gives us a slightly broader uh, view of the value chain. So we're going to have um, uh, thought leaders and subject matter experts and domain specialists from uh, leading banks in Canada. That's next week, same time. And then a week from then, we're going to continue that theme and going to have uh, additional perspectives from some of the same, but also some of the different banks uh, to come and talk to us about this important topic of AI and analytics in banking. So without further ado, though, we'll get started with our discussion for today. Welcome to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum Online. My name is Vic, and today it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, excellent discussion on keys to successful AI governance. As we've discussed in the previous uh, episodes of the webcast, that AI governance is a very important topic. It covers a lot of ground, everything from explainability, privacy, algorithmic fairness, debiasing. And we're very happy today to be joined by industry thought leaders and subject matter experts who are going to share their insights and foresights with us. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome to the stream Monica and Natalia and Mariah, who are going to be sharing with us uh, their, their thoughts on this very important topic. So before we dive into the topic, why don't we start by asking our, 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 our panel discussants about their background a little bit. Tell us about your role and also tell us a little bit about how it is that your role relates to uh, AI governance. So Monica, I'll start with you. Please tell us about your role and, and what it is that you do that brings you into the focus of uh, AI governance. Sure. Hello and welcome, everyone. Yeah, so I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of the Institute for Human Intelligence, and we're essentially a research consulting organization. And what's really significant for us is that we take a human-centered approach to the development and deployment of AI systems and emerging technologies. And by human-centered, what I mean by that is that we integrate insights from human perception and cognition. And that really comes from my background as a, as a cognitive scientist as and a technologist who has worked in understanding how we humans adapt to our evolving world. And the reason why we take this approach very seriously is because we believe that this is critical and just fundamental to the safety and equity with AI systems. And that is important because these technologies that we are creating, they're built by us humans for humans. So we're living in a human computer interactive world, not in a purely roboticized world. And that has been a problem in the thinking, especially from the engineering sciences, to, to not think about the, the full effects of how a technology can affect its its users and its and really a society at large, and so that's how we bring the element of human perception cognition to the question of AI ethics. Thank you, uh, Monica. That's great, and very happy to have you join us. And looking forward to your uh, perspectives on this topic as we go forward. Natalia, I'd like to ask you the same question as well. Over to you. Yeah, thanks much, uh, Vic. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a research director at Omdia. Uh, we are also a research uh, firm, uh, part of a, a bigger international brand uh, located in, in London, UK, called Informa. Uh, and our goal is to really inspire, inform, and connect uh, people in the AI community through 
uh, world-class research, events, media, and training. Um, my team covers um, artificial intelligence and intelligent automation space, uh, pretty much full stack, um, all the way from processors uh, to software to enterprise deployments uh, and issues like ethics, governance, sustainability, which is a big topic these days as well. Um, uh, in terms of background, professional background, uh, before coming to Omdia, I uh, spent about a third of my career working with vendors, uh, helping them build and sell analytical products. Um, the other, the second third was uh, helping clients to implement uh, these solutions. And more recently, uh, I worked in advisory capacity, advising organizations around the world on topics related to uh, data analytics, AI, everything from strategy to use cases, execution, governance, ethics, best practices, emerging trends, how do you deal with vendors, how do you select the right products. Uh, um, it actually all started with a PhD in natural language processing many, many years ago. Uh, and going back to your question, how does this relate to today's topic? Well, I did advise a lot of organizations in the past uh, four and a half, five years, uh, and now I continue advising. Uh, it's more vendors at the moment, uh, but also uh, to some extent uh, clients, organizations who are looking to uh, leverage AI for their business goals, but also want to do it responsibly and sustainably. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia. Looking forward to speaking with you on these topics. And uh, Mariah, the same question for you is tell us a little bit about your organization and how your work brings you uh, together with AI governance. Thank you, Vic. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm here in Northern California and we do have some forest fires that may be impacting my connectivity. So anyway, again, I'm Mariah Lichtenstern. I'm the founding partner of Diversity Ventures. And I do believe that how uh, our paths cross is through my advisory role with Hayden AI and their AI ethics committee. Um, and so the, the work that I do is primarily with early stage, pre-seed and seed stage startups that are impact oriented. So impact is at the forefront of my decision-making right up alongside you know, high potential for outsized returns when dealing with companies. Uh, and so with AI increasingly ubiquitous across technology firms, um, we have to take into consideration um, the the unintended consequences and sometimes the intended consequences that manifest when there's such a diverse set of interests at play. So my role, particularly at Hayden, is just to kind of anticipate and bring to the table amongst you know my peers, some who are very specialized in you know the technical side or other aspects like the frameworks, et cetera, um, and, and just bring to the table a diverse perspective and um, you know bridging some of the people who are doing this work on AI ethics um, and, and the things that they're finding to the table. That's, uh, that's great, uh, Mariah, and that's excellent. You said about uh, high returns and high impact. Those are unicorn firms, and if you can get them at the right valuation, that's that's great. Uh, excellent. Okay, so let's dive into the first question, and, and Natalia, I'd like to start with you. The first question is, so what does success look like in the design and the implementation of uh, successful AI governance? What does success look like? Uh, sure. Um, I would say it's really all about the outcomes. Uh, do we have the confidence that the AI system that we've built or are using not only delivers those desired business benefits and business uh, uh, value, but also is it accurate? Is it safe to operate, so to speak? And does it treat all of our customers fairly, uh, that it's free of algorithmic biases and other harms? And also, do we know how it's been built? Uh, can we explain to all kinds of stakeholders um, starting from our own employees uh, and end users, but also to the board of directors and uh, customers, citizens, uh, regulators, if needed. Um, can we get answers to all those questions in terms of, you know, do we have the right data? How did we get it? Is it unbiased? How accurate it is? Uh, what kind of trade-offs uh, trades off did we make when we were building the system? Uh, um, in the design, the building, the implementation, but also in tuning um, to get the desired technical and, and business results. And, and also down to technical details, you know, and to, did we even use the right type of parameters, things like that. Um, the other thing I would say also, um, it needs to be scalable. Um, I would say that many organizations probably will not uh, reinvent the wheel. They probably will use some of the existing frameworks because there are tons of them. And this is what we encourage to do. Just don't 
invent or invent the wheel. But you really need to take um, that framework and you also need to experiment with that, right? It needs to be lightweight enough uh, to deliver, for you to deliver your project quickly, uh, but not to weigh you down. And you may need to start small and iterate and tie them to your uh, business culture, to your organizational culture, to the people you have, uh, and the whole reason why your organization exists. Um, so it's it's that also fit. It's it's almost like that smooth oil that um, uh, oils all the components in the machinery and help you to run uh, faster. Uh, I'll probably keep going, but I know we've got other fantastic people on the panel, so I'll just stop here. Okay, thank you, uh, Natalia. That's great. Uh, good way to start us off. And uh, same question for you uh, as well, Mariah. So what does success look like in the governance of AI? Honestly, I believe that to be successful in both the development and the governance, it has to start with bringing diverse perspectives to the table. What goes in is what comes out. And so whether it's implicit, uh, intended or not, um, you know, you look at examples of you know, sensors recognizing or not recognizing skin color, facial recognition, classifying people of color with primates. Um, these are things that could have been caught if there was a more diverse representation of the people who are looking at this selection that's going in. Um, and so, you know, and then also looking at the outcomes or the potential abuse. If you're not bringing perspectives who have experienced, have lived experiences with those kinds of outcomes or abuse of these systems, then, you know, you may be unaware or living in a bubble. And so I think, you know, to success is incorporating diverse perspectives. And that doesn't mean tokenism and just like, oh, we have a woman here or a person of color here, a black person here, because they may be oblivious. They may be in a bubble. So there really does need to be diverse representation. And part of that could be just going outside the building. And, if, you know, of course, it, you know, having people who are actually developing the product, having that representation is key, but then also going outside the building and, um, you know, Take, availing yourself of either research institutions, um, colleges and universities, or even just laymen. If, if any of you have um, seen Coded Bias, it's an example of where just everyday people, you know, are advocating um, around how AI is impacting their lives. So I, I would just say that, you know, foundationally, it's the diverse perspectives that are going into the development and the governance so they can see, um, you know, the, the, the outcomes that, you know, or the potential and risks that need to be mitigated early on. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. That's great. And I really uh, enjoyed how you differentiated between tokenism versus actual substantive changes that do drive impact in the long run. Uh, Monica, same question for you. So in your knowledge uh, and your experience, uh, what does success look like in AI governance? Yeah, so I work with uh, multiple stakeholders in, in healthcare, in cybersecurity and robotics. And, and what that means is that I really deal with improving business optimization through increased innovation and opportunity. And from the implementation side, the metric of success, in my opinion, is really widespread public trust. AI won't be fully adopted and accepted if it's not understood. Now, trust, of course, depends on, on education. And really what that means is that the public understands what the system is, how it functions, and what they as consumers can expect from the system. This also means that from the development side, so from the designing side, the earlier area of the, the earlier phase of the AI life cycle, is that we AI builders need to know how to clearly explain what we're making in clear terms. And this also includes interacting with consumers directly because they too should have a voice at the table when the development of the types of frameworks of regulation and principles we want to be ideating because and this goes really to the point that uh was just mentioned about diversity at at the table because we scientists and business executives we know what we want right from these systems that we're building and deploying and so our criteria of what constitutes something at, at the system as fair and equitable is not necessarily the same as that from the user. And so, and, and why really? Because we come from different backgrounds, we have different priorities. And so we really need to bring that user, all users to the table so that we can consider the fundamental different values 
people put on who they are as members of a community and how that technology fits within the community. And then we can then utilize that information as builders and, and business people to then create the technology that works with people. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much, Monica. That's great. Uh, so for the next question, Mariah, I'd like to start with you, if I may. And you uh, touched in your previous answer about the importance of equity, diversity, inclusivity as sort of guiding principles and the foundational characteristics of AI governance. Uh, can you think about maybe some, um, perhaps some examples or maybe talk about some characteristics related to these uh, about how you've seen uh, organizations do this in the right way? Uh, are there certain examples? Because we hear a lot of negative examples, we hear counter examples, but are there some good examples out there of organizations that get it right, for instance? Well, something that immediately comes to mind is, I mean, there's good and bad examples. I, I gave a couple of like, you know, sensors or, uh, you know, recognizing skin color or facial recognition. There's also examples about like, say for, with facial recognition, um, you know, how can it potentially be abused? Is it, you know, our algorithm set to um, be more punitive if, if in the case of say law enforcement, um, you know, because of people of, uh, have certain complexion, right? Um, and we'd like to think that these things don't exist, but when you've had lived experiences of bias and discrimination, um, you're not so naive, right? Uh, there's other examples in terms of say education. That's a huge issue. And one of uh, my peers as an Aspen Tech Policy Hub fellow, two of my peers did a, a project called um, called uh, EdTech Equity that dealt with algorithmic bias in educational products and, and where that can go wrong. And they created a suite of recommendations on how educators can have more informed decision making in terms of the products that they're using and um, mitigating bias when it comes to um, their student body, right? Um, so those are a couple of examples. I have another peer who works in AI, um, also out of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, who deals with uh, algorithmic bias in mortgages. And so, you know, she put forth a, a suite of recommendations as well, and all of these can be seen at aspentechpolicyhub.org. Uh, so those are, you know, just examples of where it comes into play in real life day-to-day -day issues. And so, you know, again, just uh, bringing those diverse voices to the table and, and un making that part of you know, the, the learning process when you are a developer, when you are a practitioner, um, it's, it's really key. And, and I think if you're if you're informed on those issues and open minded um, and, and realizing that, you know, the benefits of AI in your use case may be detrimental to other people. If you're just open to hearing and understanding, um, then, you know, you can be more proactive in making sure that you, you know, prevent a, even a bad PR smear. Right. Because you didn't anticipate those those. Um, negative outcomes. So those are some examples that I would I would point. No, thank you, Mariah. That, that's great. Those are great examples. Uh, the links to the the projects that I mentioned with EdTech Equity and Algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all great examples. And, and as you mentioned before, th this is where really they can drive impact in society. So Monica, I'd like to turn to you with the same question is how can ethical and responsibility concerns be brought into the conversation, the discourse, and even the actual implementation of AI governance? Well, to, to add off of uh, Mariah's point, I mean, even from the perspective of uh, the research organizations and from at the research level, when it comes to proposing and looking for funding, one of the major calls coming out from the human computer interaction world. So all of us scientists who who, who really believe in, in this in this true seamless network between humans and machines is that now you can't just propose and say, okay, we're gonna make X system and it's gonna have Y outcome. We actually need to list what are the potential problems, societal impacts that can occur. So we actually need to start predicting what they can be. And then not just providing predictions, but actual risk management uh, solutions. And I think that that really, I mean, previously that was not the case. And now that is becoming even a, a requirement really in order to get funding that one has to list. And it's not just one or two, one really has to come up with a whole menu almost of potential impacts, uh, negative and positive. And then within certainly the negative, 
what does it mean to have a risk management plan in terms of because one of the problems with this is that the the technology is dynamic right it's constantly changing there are, we're literally innovating in new ways within machine learning uh, every day right and so that is being implemented in technology and so the risk management strategies also need to be dynamic and that needs to now be included in any sort of research proposal that is being submitted so i think that is a really powerful way to really force developers and designers to think outside of the of the box than they've normally been thinking Thank you, uh, Monica. Great. And then, uh, Natalia, same question to you. How can uh, ethical and responsible AI considerations be brought into the uh, process around AI governance? Well, I think I would just claim that the whole idea behind governance is really should be focusing on the, on the human uh, uh, side of technology and, and and how the individuals how the you know stakeholders the uh, customers citizens uh, uh, employees and partners be impacted by the technology it's really putting people that human element that, that uh, Monica was talking about first right how do we put this human element first and and rather than focusing maybe on just purely business outcome and business benefits can we start thinking about people and how they will be impacted by technology and what we're trying to do with that um, um, th that's probably uh, what I would suggest, uh, focus on the human element. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Natalia. And for the next question, I'd like to start with you, Natalia, is we've talked about what success looks like. We've talked about the characteristics, the underpinnings. We've even talked about some examples as well as how responsible and ethical AI is a part of the AI governance story. But now let's look at some sort of negative side of this, which is uh, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the obstacles, the hurdles that decision makers and leaders in AI need to be aware of uh, so that they don't make mistakes as it relates to AI governance? So over to you, Natalia. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The list is very long. The challenges or alternatively opportunities, right, to, to things to do something different. Uh, one of the challenges with AI governance is that uh, first you need to you need to secure executive buy-in and support for it, right? And we see consistently through research that very few organizations have support for AI in general. Uh, and even fewer for AI governance. Uh, many organizations consider governance as a, an impediment to innovation. And they're kind of many of some of them are on the fence, uh, you know, looking at what regulation is coming out and how it's going to going to impact them and their sectors, uh, because there's obviously always a cost associated with implementing any kind of governance, not just AI, but all other kinds of governance as well. Uh, what other uh, things? AI literacy uh, or lack of AI literacy, uh, understanding what this new technology fundamentally is capable of. Uh, and how it impacts and actually how it can support uh, uh, employees, not just replace them uh, with machines, but support them uh, in their jobs, uh, kind of eliminate that fear of uh, being made redundant. Uh, and also just understanding and like what it can do and, and what it, where it should or should not be used. And it's like, think of it that you know, every technology, especially complex technology that will operate a complex machinery, we don't just dive in and start using it because we can injure ourselves or people around us. Uh, sometimes we need protective equipment. Sometimes we need to understand how it works, you know, read the manual. Uh, the same, I would apply, say, apply to artificial intelligence, right? We kind of need to have a basic understanding of how it works and what it can do for us. Uh, and it's not like a car mechanic. Uh, it's the knowledge of uh, probably just how combustion engine works, which is what we all of us learned in school. Um, uh, what else? Um, um, engaging, I would flip the question a bit, if you don't mind, and sort of what the success would look like, or what do I need to do differently? Uh, is uh, some organizations just focus on governance as a technical component or just tie it to the uh, product development life cycle. Uh, well, it really needs to engage the whole organization. It needs to be treated as a business framework for mitigating risks. And uh, uh, that requires uh, creating that culture of accountability. It also uh, implies 
uh, empowering people with knowledge, with the right tools, frameworks and processes and standard operating procedures and templates, uh, but also having the right rewards in place because ultimately the success of any technology is with the in the hands of the people who use it. It could be fantastic technology, but if people are afraid uh, uh, or don't use it for whatever reasons, it, it won't be successful. So you need to create that culture of uh, uh, offering people the right information, the knowledge, empowering them, but also providing rewards. And um, as a sort of uh, uh, flip side of that, you also need to create a mechanism to protect uh, workers who might be do be, maybe whistleblowers, uh, uh, you know, if they uh, call out, identify, and report ethical violations and harms in the system, they need to be protected, and you need to be able to also to act very quickly on on uh, um, uh, the information they provide. Um, um, the other thing I just want to repeat, and I think it was Mariah who was saying uh, uh, that 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 diversity is fundamental uh, and engaging a wide range of stakeholders internally externally as well and one mistake we very often make um, and that's just because we all humans are uh, inherently biased is that we think we know what other people do or what's best for them or how it's going to impact them. I would strongly encourage, don't make any assumptions, just go and talk to people, engage those end users, engage communities, and they engage your customers as you know, beta testers or have workshops, uh, which you can actually use for dual purpose. You can educate them about your system, but you also can get insights in how it may uh, sometimes adversely impact um, that community or that population. Uh, just don't make any assumption, ask questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Natalia. Lots of uh, great things to unpack there. Mariah, I'd like to uh, ask the same question to you is, uh, we talked about the success factors, we talked about the characteristics of successful AI governance, but for leaders, uh, what are some common pitfalls? What are some common challenges, obstacles that they need to be aware of when they're designing and implementing AI governance? I think as Natalia mentioned, you know, just going out there and, and implementing something without planning for potential negative outcomes. So you know, having some governance framework, having some safeguards, having, um, you know, a board in place that can bring those different perspectives that has representation from different communities that could be stakeholders in whatever, you know, the product or application is. Um, and, and now, you know, it's really interesting that there are actually AI companies that are, you know, assisting with that governance process and employing AI to audit AI. Um, and so I think, you know, availing oneself of some research behind that and um, anticipating what can go wrong, right, the risk mitigation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariah. And Monica, same question for you. In, in you work with a lot of organizations, what are some common pitfalls, some frequently occurring hurdles that, that your work uh, around AI governance uh, makes you familiar with? So I would second really what um, Natalia has already mentioned, uh, but I guess I would just add two, two other points. The first is that we've really come to a moment where legal certainty needs to be balanced with the ability for the technology to actually evolve and R&D innovation to, to, to move forward. And what that means is that public and private partnerships really need to generally work in a synergistic way. Otherwise, what's happening is we're having a lot of aspirational guidance that's being provided, uh, it's, but the impracticability of it is is something that's starting to shine through because now it's becoming very burdensome even for especially for very small technology companies to to deal with the excessive costs and the strain of excessive processes that can actually lead to confusion instead of actual clear results and there's also the problem i want to add here to the the of false confidence from our methods of explainability and transparency, for example. And the reason why that is a problem is because it's born out of unclear definitions from the technical standpoint of what explainability and transparency really means. So you can have uh, the, the legal framework that says, okay, you must as a company show that you're, you can explain your system and you can 
exactly say how the algorithm makes uh, decisions. But that, from a technical standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, actually is not uh, clearly delineated. I would also add, so as the second uh, point, is that I think there's just a real problem right now overall where we have how the media portrays the capabilities and the needs and requirements for AI systems with what the science actually is, what industry wants to create, of course, for business opportunities, and with what society at large wants and is, is really still trying to figure out what's going on. And then at the same time, we have the public sector who sees now its role, its burgeoning role, and some people would argue it belatedly, uh, as a guide or a mediator of, of sorts. And so buy-in, and this goes back to the diversity issue that has already been uh, brought up. So buy-in really needs, from all stakeholders, we really need to consider all of these perspectives. But I think fundamentally, at the same time, we need to come up with a more unified, cohesive, pathway together in order to move forward. Otherwise, we're going to have different companies, different organizations saying one thing about what transparency and explainability or anti-bias is versus another. And that is just going to create, I think, even more chaos in terms of what consumers can expect and, and what they really want at the end of the day. Thank you, uh, thank you, Monica. That's great, and I I now know that uh, all, I think all three of the panelists talked about the importance of a framework as a central organizing principle through which analysis design uh, can be brought forward to really look at uh, the pros and cons, evaluate the trade-offs, do a pretty comprehensive uh, assessment. So, Monica, I'd like to keep the qu next question. Start with you. Is uh, there are a lot of frameworks out there? I mean, there's websites, there's other. If you search on the search engines, uh, there's lots of frameworks out there around AI governance. Uh, uh, which one or two have you found to be the most uh, useful and why? And if you don't want to talk about perhaps uh, a specific framework, what are some attributes that in a framework you think uh, would make it good in, in your professional opinion? Well, indeed, it is actually quite uh, overwhelming. In fact, I did as an exercise just to Google uh, framework uh, in you know the keyword search uh, AI governance frameworks, and my gosh, do do multiple come up? However, I think really just as uh, to sort of whittle it down to a key point is that I think we're there are several. There are basically two main approaches that have been taken. There are approaches that have been following more of a nationalistic priority. So just to give an example, we have uh, China actually came out with their big next generation AI development plan in 2017. And it, it's quite comprehensive in terms of really entering into world dominance of AI and really having a hegemonic dominance. But what I find interesting about it is that it really talks about upskilling the, their population. It really talks about we can't just invest in the funding and in the AI in AI R and D, but we really need to have our population capable of understanding what this is and being able to work with it. So having deep knowledge, I think that's a very interesting way to to to, to think about how an approach. Another approach is the kind that is informed more from seeking out a, a network of experts that come from different fields, whether it's academia, industry, or government, to form a steering committee. And those steering committees then come together. And just as an example, again, at the bigger, uh, at the bigger level, we have the uh, European Commission came out with their steering committee. It was the uh, high level expert group on AI in 2018, in which they brought people together to literally come up with the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. So that is an interesting approach because that really says we need to consider the, the rights of citizens. We need to keep as the, the fundamental goal, human rights and democratic values. So let's come up with a checklist basically of what constitutes as trustworthy AI. Now at the smaller level, so not looking at it from the, uh, the geopolitical level, but at the smaller level in terms of organizations and companies, what I'm seeing to be very interesting and actually quite effective, it's, is now that there's more of a proactive approach on the on the side of of a company 
to really think about potential impact and risks of the technology they are using, whether they acquire it from, from others or the technology that they are developing. And that also has been more like a steering committee type of a uh, procedure in which they bring in multiple experts to come in and talk about these issues. And I think what's missing more often than not is bringing in the, the general public into the conversation. And this has already come up in what uh, everyone has been mentioning that again, that diversity of perspective needs to come in whether we're talking about nationalistic priorities at the geopolitical scale, or we're talking about it at the, at the smaller level uh, within an, an organization. Thank you, uh, Monica. And I'd like to ask the same question uh, to Natalia. So Natalia, if I may ask you the same question, which is uh, in terms of frameworks, you also mentioned uh, the importance of frameworks as these organizing uh, principles. So, so what's a good framework or, or equally importantly, what's the characteristics of a good framework in your mind? Yeah, sure, Vic. Um, so I have uh, two which I like. Uh, one of them is actually both a framework and a product uh, developed by a Finnish company called Sidot.ai. And by the way, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I just like uh, what they've built. And also their um, CEO and co-founder is actually, uh, she chairs the uh, IEEE's Committee on um, ethics, ethics Certification Program for Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. So, you know, there's quite significant credentials there as well. Uh, so what that product does uh, in that company, it kind of um, uh, functions as a lightweight governance framework. Uh, and it's completely uh, modular. Uh, and by the way, it has already been implemented by uh, the city of Helsinki and the city of Amsterdam, um, uh, among um, other of their clients and uh, guest beta testers. Uh, but it built, it's built on the concept of this uh, idea of public register. And what kind of information do you need to provide and at what level of granularity to help people understand what the system is doing, how it was built, uh, you know, what kind of decisions have we made when we were building it, but also who to contact if you have any questions as a citizen. And for example, in, in how the city of Helsinki or the city of Amsterdam is using AI in their applications, who do you contact to provide your feedback uh, or get more, maybe more technical information if you're so inclined? Um, and again, by answering those questions to be able to provide information to the citizens, you kind of force yourself internally to think through uh, uh, some of the elements of governance which, which we talked about. And um, it also helps you to document some of the key assumptions, key decisions and so forth. Uh, so that's one. The other one I like is actually the one that Taka Riga mentioned a few weeks ago from the US Government Accountability Office. Uh, I did take a look at that. I was very curious what they come up with. And that's the AI accountability framework for federal agencies and other entities, so hopefully not just for government. It's, it's fairly simple. Uh, it's very easy to understand what it's asking for. And what I also like about it is uh, three things. One of them is that it lists questions you should be asking uh, of your system and your development team but also it tells you what audit procedures should be in place and what evidence should you be providing in case you need to do that for like regulators, for example. Um, it um, lists key governance uh, practices, like best practices and emerging practices at the level of organization, but also system level. And finally, it draws, it's, it's really a summary um, and synthesis of um, all of the existing research that uh, uh, Monica just mentioned, that whole body of research what they've done, they took it in and digested it and kind of simplified and summarized it. Uh, and it has multiple references, multiple examples. So the kind of curious where it came from, you can actually go and take a look at that. So again, those two. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, that's great, Natalia. And uh, so for the next question, Monica, I'd like to come to you first, which is that the we know that the field of AI is changing rapidly. And I know uh, panelists discussed today just how quickly information is coming out and some of it is relevant, some of it is not so relevant. So how do you make sure that your knowledge about AI governance is current and stays up to date? Uh, because certainly this is an area that's changing very rapidly. And how do you stay abreast of all the latest uh, developments in this space? 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, that, that is, uh, I think that's probably the most complex in because it really does require expertise in, in AI under true deep knowledge of what is happening. And if there is an individual or sets of individuals who do not have that, it can become very difficult, right, to keep up uh, with what's happening. And so there are maybe here uh, two uh, fundamental issues or three fundamental issues. One is well, I, myself personally, I am involved in the actual development of these systems. So I come from that technical background. And so I stay abreast even within the own uh, my own technical field by literally reading the latest uh, that comes out from IEEE, for example, uh, of, in the areas of machine learning, in uh, AI at, at large. And so I'm constantly looking at what's being done. I'm also look at it from a global perspective. I, again, this goes back to the issue we brought up of, uh, we've all brought up with respect to diversity of perspective and, uh, and thought. And we need to know what's happening across the world because there are differences in how the technology is being built because the priorities are different. So that is, that's how I stay abreast as, as well as somebody who does go to a lot of conferences and participates even with my own research. The other element I would say for the non-technical individual is this is where education and communication are fundamental. So the, and this goes back and that's why I gave the example of uh, upskilling. Uh, being so important, for example, for um, uh, China's uh, priorities. Upskilling is needs to be taken seriously by the by everyone, by education, the educational world, by government, and by industry. And so we cannot just hope and de and depend on new degrees or courses to be happening at universities colleges and even lower K through 12, but really we need the current workers in, in industry and in particular organizations need, that needs to be a priority. And so that along with the constant tracking and monitoring of what these new AI developments, in fact, is paramount even for the types of governance framework we create in, in companies or help companies with, because that's actually starting to also change the design criteria. And also going back to that comment I mentioned earlier about the dynamic risk management frameworks that also need to be made because the technology, the technology is changing. And so this back and forth of tracking and monitoring isn't just about who's making what, when, and, and where, but why are they making it? And what are the cultural slash academic slash uh, political priorities that are actually influencing these different uh, changes within the design criteria and, and rich risk management frameworks? So it, gosh, it, it's complex and I could go on and on about this, but um, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Very comprehensive. And Natalia, same question for you, because what's interesting is uh, not only as an, as, a, as an industry advisor do your clients expect you to have the knowledge, but I'm sure at some level from a meta perspective, they want you to tell them how it is that you keep up to speed with all of these uh, latest developments coming. So tell us a little bit about sort of uh, both aspects of it, sort of how you stay up to date, but also is this something that you find where there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of uh, interest in your client base for them to know how it is that they should stay fully uh, up to speed with these kinds of uh, innovations. Yeah, sure, Vic. Um, so a couple things. So first from me, uh, I do read a lot. I, I subscribe to a lot of newsletters uh, and, you know, direct uh, channels. So I actually read a lot uh, and sort of track in terms of, and, and also participate in, in some uh, consultations uh, that are open uh, and looking for feedback, for example, on, on, on their draft regulations or draft principles or frameworks and so forth. Uh, but for the organizations, what I would recommend is because regulatory compliance is actually a very important component of governance, right? I would suggest that you need to monitor developments uh, and whether you do it yourself, you know, through maybe your um, uh, government relations or public or some sort of other function in your organization, uh, but track developments in national, international policies, procedures, regulation standards, but also within your industry uh, or a specific sector. What are the new standards or guidelines being developed? And even better, get engaged in developing them because there's a lot of 
work happening right now with, uh, for example, you know, with uh, um, IEEE uh, here in Canada, uh, Standards Council of Canada, uh, uh, you know, internationally as well, all of this work happening. So you, you need to find a way to track all of that uh, development. And again, best of all, even just to, to get engaged. Um, the other thing I would say, um, and just to kind of um, um, second Monica, uh, uh, is that you need to track how the governance in evolves because the technologies evolve. And with that, you need to ensure that the framework you've, you're implementing is actually scalable and flexible enough, not something that's monolithic, but you can actually scale it up or modify it going forward, depending again on either regulatory requirements or depending on how technology have changed. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that you need to fit it with organizational culture as well. And, and I just can't stress it enough. Um, just maybe because we're over lunch, you know, uh, I'm, I'm gonna draw an analogy to lasagna. It's pretty much the same recipe for lasagna, doesn't matter who you ask, but every Italian family have their own family recipe, right? Uh, so it's slightly different. And this is like, I'm not saying that governance, yeah, governance is, is lasagna, but it's, it's the, the idea is the same, right? You need to take it and tune it to fit it in and continue developing, continue modifying as, as, as things change on the market. Thank you. So I think that's a that's a great uh, great answer there. Uh, and I'll see. We were having a slight technical difficulty with our panelists. Let me see if I can add them back to the stream. Uh, Mariah, if you're still with us, I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked Monica and Natalia. So I'm going to combine the questions. Uh, is there a framework, or are there characteristics of a framework that you find useful when it comes to uh, looking at AI governance? And also, the second question is uh, the field of AI is changing so quickly. Governance, particularly, how do you stay up to speed, and how do you keep up with the latest developments? Well, first of all, Vic, thank you for bringing me back in and your your patience with the technical challenges. I was just uh, heartbroken. I was listening to Monica talk about the he hegemonic, in, uh, you know, element and the upskilling, and um, just really want to underscore how important that is in terms of you know frameworks and what I see as the the future of you know better practices of AI governance. There is a company that my friend Kamal at Loyal BC out of Canada. Uh, turned me on to, and I'm really excited about the work that they're doing. It's called Fairly.ai. And what they do is they help to standardize um, the testing, the management of uh, inventory. Some, you know, when you look at banks, they, they may have thousands of different AI models. Um, and then they provide ongoing monitoring and reporting so that people are able to, you know, keep track of the debugging they've done, the updates that they've done, and provide documentation, um, be able to, you know, validate their workflows and facilitate collaboration among, um, you know, both the, their internal teams and then any external uh, stakeholders and providing analytics within a, a dashboard. And so I think giving uh, organizations tools to manage and report on the AI systems that they're using is going to be critical when, as has been mentioned before, AI is now ubiquitous. It's it's everywhere and, and it's providing much needed, um, a much needed way of processing big data which you know it has has been laying dormant, uh, and so we need it, but we need to also anticipate and put guardrails around it. And so that's one of the the types of tools that I kind of referenced earlier um, that I think is really really important to put in the hands of these organizations, particularly those that may not be you know high tech themselves, but they're applying this technology without fully understanding it. So that's that's one example that I would put forward. Okay, thank you, uh, Mariah. That's great. So uh, let's let's turn to some of the questions in the chat. There's a question here, and Mariah, maybe I can ask this question to you first because you work a lot with ventures and you have a deep understanding of sort of the startup landscape and the and the uh, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So the question is, uh, so what are some of the key governance topics to address when it comes to remote monitoring of healthcare and safety? So if you have sort of uh, you know smart wearables, IoT devices connected to some AI hub, which is being used for some kind of health tracking or, or, or those types of things, what are certain things that you would advise entrepreneurs or founders of those types of ventures to be aware of? I mean, certainly privacy, I'm sure, would come to top of mind. But are there other things, Mariah, that you would kind of coach founders uh, in that specifically in that startup space? 
Well, particularly with with you know the medical um, field, of course, you know privacy is of great importance. And then you know we've heard a lot, particularly lately, in the context of COVID, but also just you know with the BLM movement, um, you know the disparities in health outcomes, and you know whether it's you know not recognizing or believing, say, black patients. This is an experience that I've had personally, and I've also um, had the anecdotal juxtaposition of my experience, for example, as a black mother compared to that of my white mother, and being the beneficiary of her privilege as a child, and and in comparing those experiences. So in this particular case, and and it can apply to other cases as well. I think having an understanding of the biases that exist within the medical industry, not only in terms of you know outcomes and unintended consequences but actually even doing a deeper dive to find out, you know, the cases of, that have been egregious where it is, it is, it's just the status quo that people have certain belief systems that are, you know, um, they're, they're supported, they're allowed, they're endorsed um, in, internally within educational systems. I have a, a cousin who's a, an MD, an internist, a hospital internist in New York. And when you hear some of the experiences of, of um, doctors of color coming up through the system, uh, you have a better understanding and insight of why these issues manifest in practice. So I think even doing that kind of research, again, going outside the building, quote unquote, as we say in startup development, when you're applying the lean launch methodology, you know, going and talking to doctors of color, talking to uh, nurses of color, talking to patients of color, and, you know, comparing that with, with others as well. The difference between the, the female experiences versus the male experience um, and how much, you know, research is based on, you know, white male um, uh, data, right? And so just being aware of those historical and persistent, um, you know, uh, disparities uh, is, is again, foundational to having the broader understanding of now we're bringing AI in to process data that is directly influenced by these historical and persistent disparities. So that's definitely key. And then of course, all of the, the universal concerns around privacy, et cetera, come to play as well. Thank you, Mariah. That, that's great. And you know, if I may uh, also just add to something you said is I, I completely agree. You, you said something, a lot of very profound things. I've advised startups for a long time myself. And one of the things is, you know, I think it's conventional wisdom for all entrepreneurs to say, hey, look, uh, it's not technology out, it's customer in. So everybody starts, all entrepreneurs start by saying, look, we really focus on our customers. We know exactly what they want. We know what their pain points are. We know how they make decisions. We know what their budget is. But as you use the word in a slightly different context, Mariah, around tokenization, I think that happens too in the startup world is I think eventually, uh, because now it's fashionable, I think all entrepreneurs do say that, look, we, we put technology second, we put customer requirements first. But I think even there, there's a spectrum is do you really know what your customer needs? Do you really know what your customer is impacted by and impacts? in the world or are you just saying it because well i mean intuitively yes of course it makes sense no 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 uh, fi financier or vc would give you money if you walked in and said i've got a great idea and i don't i've really not done any market validation so i think it's great that you said that that you know going out into the field and really validating your assumptions and uh, start with hypotheses but really understanding what is it about uh, health and safety uh, in that space uh, that, that that drives the behavior of of, of uh, clients in that space. Uh, Monica, same question for you, if I may ask, but slightly differently is uh, you work with clients in the healthcare and in the public safety space or more broadly, the safety space. Uh, what are some of their concerns around uh, this topic of, uh, of, of AI governance? Yeah, I actually really bring in the, I mean, I second Mariah's comments, absolutely everything and Vic, what, everything else you just mentioned. Uh, but I would also add the, the cybersecurity issue, right? Uh, many times I think it's not being considered and we know that uh, the cyber attacks are, are happening more and more often. It's it's literally a billion dollar business to, to affect organizations, companies, governments entirely through cyber attacks. And I think what people forget, and, and this is not so much from the technologist standpoint, but from those who are not in the technology world, is that there is just such a sheer quantity and diversity of devices that come from different manufacturers, different that have different device iterations, and and that have different embedded security uh, properties. And so until security is by default and by design, every device developed is gonna have at least 
an entry point. There's going to, with the least security, is going to have an entry point into the infrastructure. And so really what I'm saying here is that one needs to take a zero trust approach to the security problem because we need to know what is in all of these edge nodes and these edge devices and in the cloud for which these technologies are are, are using. If we don't have a sound understanding of, of that, then you can have the most amazing uh, technology available out there. You can have actually all of your un clear understanding. You went out into the field and you figured out, you know, okay, this is who my customer is. This is who my uh, this is who my customer is not. These are the priorities of that particular customer, and all of that can fall apart with a security breach. And so I have actually been recently focusing a lot. This has been a, a priority. I've been really pushing that there needs to be a, a robust security framework to add on to the privacy issue as well, obviously, because privacy and security are uh, tethered together. I'm applauding off camera here, by the way, to that point. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariah. Thank you, Monica. And uh, Natalia, same question for you is you have a lot of clients in the, in the healthcare space, or I'm sure in the regulated industries. So what are some of the topics that they're raising for you, Natalia, in terms of uh, concerns that they have or, or aspirations that they have? Um, I, I'm, Mariah and Monica covered a lot of the aspects actually, but I do want to support uh, what Monica was saying with adversarial attacks. Uh, they're already happening. Uh, we actually see a lot of clients asking, you know, how do the, the big ones, how do the, you know, hyperscalers, the, 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 you know, the largest providers and users of AI technologies, how do they actually secure and safeguard their own uh, models, their own data sets, and, and also, uh, you know, the platform, the capability that they expose and sell to their customers, you know, uh, what do they do internally and do they use the same protocols, procedures, uh, tools uh, as they provide through their platforms? Because uh, it's happening. We, we don't see much of it in the news because uh, some of it is just doesn't see the light of day because of the sensitivity of the issue, but it is happening. Uh, and you need to make sure that uh, your vendor, if you're working with vendors or if you're building yourself, that you have that in place. Um, uh, and by the way, it's like with security breaches, uh, the same for with adversarial attacks against AI. You, you should assume that it's already, it will happen. The question is not whether, the question is when and how prepared and ready are you for that. Uh, the other thing I want to go back is actually less of a recommendation, but maybe uh, if I may make a suggestion for a book, because uh, Mariah mentioned this topic of uh, a lot of applications, a lot of uh, tools, a lot of products in the world that build uh, for men by men. So I have a book which I highly recommend. It should be a quiet reading for everybody. It's called Invisible Women but by Caroline Creata Perez. Uh, it's full of examples from all facets of lives on how things are built for man by man, not intentionally. It, this is just how things happened. And I think the chapter two starts ask a question, you know, can snow plowing uh, be sexist? And I was like, well, it doesn't make any sense. But there's a whole chapter on it. And if you read about, again, it's an eye-opening book and it should be a recommended, uh, a mandatory reading for everybody engaged in analytics and AI and building the systems. Thank you, Natalia. That was uh, very helpful as well. And you know, this was a great conversation. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, there's so much more to talk about. So on that, I'd like to thank the panelists and uh, would love to have you back in a couple of months so we can continue this conversation and bring in some additional insights and foresight. But thanks again on behalf of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum for making time in your day to join us. And uh, we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Pleasure. Stay safe.